Hi everyone, this is Jason Burek of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest, had him on when his uh, most recent book came out, The Death of Money. Uh, he's He has two very good best-selling books that I highly recommend, Currency Wars and also The Death of Money. He has over 35 years of experience working on Wall Street as a lawyer and also as an investment banker. Uh, thank you for joining us again, Jim Rickards. Thank you, Jason. Great to be with you. Now, um, Jim, let's talk about Currency Wars. Um, the the euro has just basically it just seems to me like the euro has gotten too strong. The European exporters have uh, said, you know, the euro's too strong. We want it uh, devalued so we can have more competitive exports. Uh, is that what you think is going on with the currency wars right now, or why do you think the euro, uh, the ECB wanted to devalue the euro? Well, the problem with uh, devaluing the euro, uh, Jason, is that um, it, it's sort of not a, a free lunch. There, is, uh, there are consequences associated with it. And the important thing, I think, for listeners to understand about the currency wars is people tend to think of it in one direction, like, oh, there's a currency war going on, so the dollar is going down and these other currencies are going up, or the dollar is going up and these other currencies are going down and they're fighting this currency war. And, and that's part of it. But what I think listeners have to understand is that it's like a seesaw. It goes back and forth and back and forth. And that's one reason why currency wars don't have a logical conclusion. They can go on. And I said this in my book, uh, Currency Wars, that came out in 2011. They can go on for five or 10 or 15 years. So again, uh, that my book, uh, Currency Wars, uh, did come out in 2011, but I'm not the least bit surprised. We're sitting here in 2014, almost 2015, and the newspapers are full of stories about currency wars, and a lot of reporters are acting like this is something new. And I've been trying to point out, no, this is the same currency war that started in 2010. This is the same currency war that's been going on for the last five years. It's just a, the latest episode of the latest battle. If you think about um, you know, World War II, it lasted for... Uh, you know, six years, depending on uh, which power you're talking about. Uh, but it wasn't all fighting all the time. There were quiet periods, and then there were big battles, you know, like the Battle of Stalingrad or D-Day or whatever. So we're in one of those big battles right now between the euro and the dollar, but it, but it's the same currency war. But that, the importance of that is that uh, people should expect it to continue and expect this to be part of the investment landscape. Now, what's happening right now? It's true that uh, the dollar has gone through a period of great strength. Uh, you know, really in the last six months, the dollar went up 8% against the euro and the yen. That's huge. You know, in, in, in cross rates and foreign exchange trading, you know, people talk about uh, thousands of a basis point or, you know, a couple bips or, you know, very, very tiny changes are uh, good days action in, in currencies. And here you have uh, eight percentage points of gain by the dollar against the euro in, in the last several months. That That's a gigantic move, um, but completely non-sustainable. Now, markets have been misreading Europe, um, you know, for, for years. They continue to misread it. And I just, I, I don't know how many times I have to repeat it. I, I spell this out in chapter uh, five of my new book, The Death of Money. Um, Mario Draghi is not going to stimulate the European economy. That's just beginning to sink in uh, as we speak. But, you know, going back to last summer, um, you know, we went to negative rates. Everyone said, OK, here it comes. You know, here comes QE uh, from Europe. Here comes Draghi's QE. Here comes the cheaper euro. And the euro did trade down from about um, 139 all the way down to around 125 or so. But all Draghi ever cares about is price stability and the success of the euro itself. He's, he does not think he can stimulate the European economy. He does not have a mandate to stimulate the European economy. He's not going to. Uh, so the recent uh, the backtracking, the recent gain in the euro against the dollar is supposedly based on this disappointment that uh, Draghi is not going to engage in QE. But I said last summer, and I've said before that, that he's, he's never going to. Um, now, from the dollar perspective, this is the worst possible thing that could happen to the United States. A strong dollar is Janet Yellen's worst nightmare. Strong dollar is deflationary. So here you have the central bank, the, the Fed, saying over and over and over, we want inflation, we want inflation. You know, they have a 2% long-term target. They have a 2.5% short-term target. I've heard um, some of the members of the FOMC say privately they wouldn't mind 3 or 3.5% three inflation. So here you have a central bank that wants inflation. Uh, but the most recent data has shown deflation. You know, C CPI and PPI have been uh, popping up negative on certain months, which is deflationary. Well, a strong dollar is deflationary. It actually lowers the cost of U.S. imports. 
um, and and that feeds through the supply chain and lowers costs overall. So uh, it's the last thing the Fed wants. So when I saw the so-called weak euro and the strong dollar, yeah, look, you can't fight the tape. I can read the tape. I knew what was going on in the markets. But my conclusion was that, uh, first of all, uh, global investors were misreading Draghi. The Draghi is not in the stimulus business. He is in the uh, price stability business, but he would do enough to avoid deflation in Europe, but no more. Uh, and he sort of got some help there by a cheaper euro. And secondly, the U.S. could not tolerate the strong dollar, not for long. Now, what, they, what the U.S. did do is we sort of, um, you know, that people misread the economy. You know, around mid-year 2014, it looked like the U.S. economy was stronger. Second quarter GDP was strong. It looked like the U.S. might be on a self-sustaining path. Europe was clearly in uh, recession. Japan had fallen off a cliff. Uh, the whole world needed a lifeline, and we threw them a lifeline in the form of a stronger dollar. We said, okay, we'll suck it up and deal. We'll bear the total cost of global structural uh, adjustment. We'll allow our currency to appreciate. You guys, you know, Europe and Japan and some other trading partners, Australia, Brazil, others, you can cheapen your currencies and try to get a little stimulus, try to get a little inflation. The problem is that our economy is much weaker than the policymakers thought. That weakness is now becoming very apparent, and we may have thrown them a lifeline, but now we have to pull it in and use the lifeline ourselves. And so I look for um, – um, look, the taper is going to finish you know, shortly, but I look for uh, – uh, much more dovish FOMC in 2015. Uh, there's no way the Fed's going to raise interest rates in 2015. All this talk about, you know, will they raise them in March or raise them in July? They can't raise rates. The U.S. economy is weak. Uh, labor force participation is declining. Uh, real wages are going nowhere. Uh, the idea that they're going to raise rates in the face of that data is nonsense, and that data is not getting better. So don't look for a rate increase in 2015. It wouldn't surprise me to see QE4. All of that is very... Um, Negative for the dollar, that kind of easy money um, is going to bring the dollar down. Uh, Draghi's firm line, Draghi said it publicly that he's not going to do more to stimulate. So I look for all these trades to reverse. So I look for dollar down, euro up, gold up, but not right away. I mean, kind of that will play out over the next six months or so. But it's a reversal of what we've seen over the past three months, and it's a continuation of the currency wars. Now, um, the, these myopic rent-seeking Keynesians, you know, they, they're inflationistas. They prefer inflation to deflation, clearly. We're seeing that now play out in Japan, who's basically been using, you know, Keynesian stimulus longer than anyone else, including the United States. I, I think we're seeing stagflation in Japan, uh, at least with the, the people I talk to and with the data. Uh, the people I talk to out of Japan who tell me that, you know, their food and their energy bills are going through the roof, but Japan doesn't have their own natural resources, so their input, input prices are going crazy. You brought up, though, uh, the taper uh, for the U.S., but you also reported that the CIA informed the U.S. that that uh, China and uh, Russia were dumping U.S. Treasuries, and then that's why the Belgium Treasury purchases is occurring, which basically the, the Belgium Treasury – U.S. Treasury purchases are the exact amount of the taper, right? So if, if all these Treasuries are being stuffed out of Belgium, is, it, uh, are, are, is the U.S. really tapering that? Well, uh, tapering has to do with um, U.S. Uh, central bank purchases of U.S. government securities. The question is, are, are other people buying them? So maybe call it, a, you know, a, a friends of the taper or friends of the Fed. Uh, I, I wish the CIA had told the Treasury that. that uh, uh, to my knowledge, they didn't, uh, but you didn't need the CIA. You could see it in the public data. The, 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 you know, you just look at the Treasury tick report. You could see that the uh, Russia in particular was uh, was dumping U.S. Treasuries beginning last October, October 2013. That was probably in preparation for moves in uh, Crimea and trying to insulate themselves from U.S. financial sanctions. Uh, my, my concern is not that uh, the data is secret, but that no one's looking. Uh, so, um, yeah, I think you can use – what we call market or market intelligence uh, price signals that are available to everybody. It's not secret classified information. It's just stuff you can find from, you know, getting a Bloomberg or a price feed. Um, and uh, but the question is, are you looking? Do you know how to interpret it? Do you know how to link it to geopolitical events? And that's really the the art that I think needs some uh, development um, still on the on the part of the U.S. government. But getting back to your uh, main point, Jason. Um, well, look, if the, if the data gets bad enough, the Fed will go back and buy the securities themselves. Now, who's buying through Belgium? Well, clearly, it's not the government of Belgium. It's not, uh, it, you know, Belgian dentists and lawyers and doctors. It's some other international actor. Is it the Fed acting through nominees? Is it the ECB? Um, is it, uh, you know, perhaps China who doesn't want it to be known what they're doing? And that's all possible, but um, but but the fact of the matter is the main player is still the Fed. 
Uh, and, you know, there's so much uh, people got so spun up in uh, December 2012 when the Fed started the, uh, the taper. Uh, but what people forget is that the Fed has tapered twice before. Uh, the end of QE1 was 100 percent taper. The end of QE2 was 100 percent taper. Uh, and now that they're adding they're ending QE3, that's the third taper. Uh, yes, they did it gradually, not all at once, but it's still a taper. Well, what do we know from QE1 and QE2? What do we know from those tapers? They both failed. When uh, QE ended, QE1 ended, and QE2 ended, the stock market went sideways, uh, down a little bit. Um, the economy hit stall speed, um, and they had to come back with more. So what we know, we have two data points, what we know about tapering is that tapering fails. So QE3 will also fail. And for, for, QE3, for the QE3 taper not to fail uh, compared to QE1 and QE2 taper, something has to have changed. So what's different in the U.S. economy? The answer is nothing's different. Uh, in fact, a lot of things have gotten worse. So um, I would expect QE taper will fail again. Uh, the U.S. economy will, uh, uh, if you know, may contract, uh, certainly slowing down, certainly not getting anywhere near near the kind of self-sustaining growth we want. We're seeing that in the stock market action. The stock market, you know, remember the stock market through a tamper. Uh, pardon me, the stock market through a, a tantrum at the end of QE2. Uh, if you go back to QE2, that was announced in, uh, it was leaked in August of 2010 at Jackson Hole. It was rolled out officially in November 2010 at the Fed meeting. And it was over in June 2011 when they hit their targets. Well, all of the benefit to the stock market took place on the front end between August and November. If you look at a stock chart, you'll see the market went up very strongly in September and October of 2010, just on the leak. Um, but that's what markets do. They discount the future. Once the Fed said what they were going to do, the market reacted immediately. But by March of 2011, the market was going sideways. The market was saying to the Fed, hey, what else have you got? You know, you've already told us this is over. June, June 2011. So what else have we got? Well, the Fed didn't have anything else. And so they had to invent Operation Twist, which is really just throwing a bone to the market. Well, now uh, in uh, you know October 2014, we're seeing this huge daily volatility. We're seeing the stock market draw down. It's another temper tantrum. The Fed saying, or sorry, the market saying to the Fed, what else have you got? You know, you can't taper. You can't back away. The Fed has no exit. They have to keep printing money. Uh, they just seem to not learn that lesson. Uh, they, they probably wish they had never started this, but here we are. So um, my expectation is that uh, markets will go down to as uh, stock markets will go down to sideways. Uh, it'll become very apparent that the U.S. economy is weak. It will become very apparent that the Fed's not going to raise rates. Maybe do QE4. And on that news, uh, I would expect the dollar to go down, the euro to go up. And uh, don't be surprised if stocks rally if they announce QE4. I mean, as bad as it is. Uh, I think it's lousy policy. It's, I'm not in favor of it personally, but my opinion doesn't matter. What matters is what Janet Yellen thinks. Uh, and if they come with QE4 in you know, April or May of next year, stocks could actually go up on that news for the wrong reasons. You know, it's just, but it just means more easy money, more leverage, and ultimately a bigger asset bubble and a bigger collapse. But that's sort of down the road. Yeah, the, the taper tantrum you talked about, it's like the market and Wall Street is like a spoiled child. You know, once you start giving them candy or money to go buy candy and toys and video games and things like that, and then all of a sudden you try to inflict discipline on them, you know, they're, they're not going to like it very much. But um, my, my next question, Jim, is uh, switching gears here, is about China and the SDR. You put a, a, a link on your Twitter feed a, a number of months ago about a Chinese People's Bank of China talking about the SDR. Do, do you think China really wants the SDR, or, or is the um, – Chinese central bank and the Chinese government divided about whether or not it wants the world reserve currency immediately or it wants to transition to an SDR? Well, China is not even close to having a world reserve currency. They're not prepared for that. They may want it eventually, but uh, they're, they're – again, they don't meet any of the criteria. There's a lot of confusion about the difference between a trade currency and a reserve currency. Everything China is doing right now is designed to promote their role as a trade currency. So these bilateral swap deals you see with Brazil and Switzerland and other countries, um, that's designed to improve the liquidity in the Chinese yuan, uh, get settlement payments mechanisms. I mean, after all, if I do want to use yuan to pay for Chinese goods or Chinese exports, I need some way of, uh, you know, holding them in a bank account and wiring the money and, uh, you know, creating that what I call the plumbing of the financial system. And that's fairly primitive as regards to the yuan. So that, that part of it is moving quickly. And um, the Chinese yuan is expanding as a trade currency. But to be a reserve currency, you need a very large deep pool of investable assets. I mean, what are reserves? 
reserves are just your your savings account for a country. So, you know, if you make $100,000 and you spend $90,000 and you have $10,000 left over, you know, and you put it in the bank or you can buy stocks or invest it somehow, but think of that as your reserves. That's your savings. Uh, well, it's no different with a country. If you run a trade surplus or current account surplus uh, and you have foreign direct investment, uh, you're going to earn reserves. Well, you have to invest it somewhere. You can't, you know, China's got $4 trillion in reserves. They can't stick it under a mattress. They have to go buy something. Well, the only market in the world big enough to absorb those kinds of savings inflows, uh, reserve inflows, is the U.S. Treasury market. And that's why they all own U.S. Treasuries, uh, not exclusively, but to a very large extent, 60% of world uh, reserves uh, are in U.S. dollar, mostly in U.S. Treasuries, because it's the only market big enough to absorb the inflows. So uh, so what do you need to be a reserve currency? Well, you need to create a securities market, and not just a securities market. You need um, to issue bonds, sovereign bonds across all maturities, everything from 30 days to 30 years. Uh, you need dealers to make a market in them. You need uh, f uh, futures and options to hedge them. You need a repo market to finance them. You need settlement clearance mechanisms. Above all, you need a rule of law so that people can have some assurance of this recourse in the event of a bankruptcy or in the event of any other um, uh, you know, contractual breaches. Well, China doesn't have any of that. There's no large Chinese sovereign bond market. There's no large set of dealers in Chinese sovereign bonds. There's no infrastructure for repo or futures or options. And China has no rule of law. So China is not equipped to have a reserve currency whatsoever. You know, you know, 20 years, could they get there? Possibly, but it would take you know, the better part of 20 years. But here's what China actually is doing. China wants to have their cake and eat it. They want to be a kind of a reserve currency without opening the capital account and building the infrastructure I just described. The way to do that is to say, well, the world, the, the world reserve currency, the coming reserve currency, the thing that's going to replace the dollar, is the IMS special drawing right. So China is trying to be a reserve currency through the back door by being included in the basket that makes up the SDR. The SDR is the, the special drawing right. Now, if you look at that basket today, and all this information is available on the IMF website, it's you know, what's in it. Well, it's the dollar, it's the euro, it's the yen, Swiss francs, uh, sterling. Um, there might be a couple other currencies in there, but uh, but the point is they're all those sort of traditional hard currencies. The Chinese yuan is not included. Um, but uh, what people don't understand is that the uh, IMF um, uh, executive board has the ability to change the composition of the basket. They could vote to include the Chinese yuan. And that, by the way, that's, those discussions are taking place as we speak. Uh, right now, the IMF um, uh, annual meeting is taking place in Washington and behind closed doors. The Chinese are discussing the mechanism and the timing of including the Chinese yuan in the SDR basket. So that's China's way of uh, being, in effect, a global reserve currency, because once you make the SDR reserve currency and the Chinese yuan is included, it's de facto part of the global reserve without opening up the Chinese capital account to the kind of direct capital inflows in Chinese yuan denominated bond market that I described. So that's kind of the, the big picture. Now, the U.S. is standing in the way of that. There's all kinds of pushing and shoving uh, about China demanding more votes at the IMF, the U.S. standing in the way, but the IMF demanding that the U.S. pony up the $100 billion we promised them at the uh, Pittsburgh uh, G20 summit in uh, September 2009. Uh, we never honored that obligation. That requires a vote of Congress. There's a lot of opposition from people like Rand Paul, Ted Cruz, and uh, uh, Jeff Penciling and other sort of uh, if not Tea Party members, at least friends of the Tea Party, let's say. A lot of suspicion about um, the IMF intentions there. They're going to try to slide it through the lame duck session. Boehner's okay with it. They're going to try to stick it on some bill. We'll see how that plays out. But IMF governance, IMF uh, politics are uh, a mess right now because of this fighting between the U.S. and China. The U.S. is trying to uh, you know, constrain China's degrees of freedom. China is trying to break out of the constraints by barging into the FDR and getting more votes at the IMF. Uh, so kind of watch that space. But what it's all leading up to is the use of the SDR as the new global reserve currency. That's the one that, that will replace the dollar. If anything replaces the dollar, it's not going to be the Chinese yuan. Uh, it's going to be the SDR alongside of, you know, with dollars and euros and uh, and Swiss francs and some of the other currencies that, that make up the basket. And uh, the next time there's a global liquidity crisis, that's going to be bigger than the central banks. The Fed's not going to be able to print uh, and guarantee uh, tens of uh, trillions of dollars as they did the last time. Those trillions of uh, 
of dollars are going to come in the form of printing of SDRs by the IMF, and China wants to be part of that uh, party. Yeah, I, I don't want the SDR. I don't think you want the SDR because I think I've heard you say in past interviews that it would be incredibly inflationary. I, I want to get back to more of a hard money type of system here where we don't have behind the scenes, you know, these central banks and these politicians doing bailout programs and massive QE programs and, you know, buying garbage off banks and giving them more dollars to speculate with and potentially blow up their balance sheet or, or you know, bring the world economy to its knees. Um, it, um, my, my next question, though, is uh, about financial warfare and potentially, you know, the U.S.'s ability and Wall Street's ability to move down the commodities markets. You know, we've seen re uh, Russia is a major producer of platinum, palladium, uh, oil, and natural gas. Do you think the U.S. is retaliating against Russia, Saudis, and OPEC for doing these bilateral trade agreements outside of the petrodollar? Well, there's no doubt that there's a financial war going on. I think the U.S. is an actor, but so is Russia. In other words, this is going back and forth. Um, the U.S. has imposed economic sanctions uh, on, on Russia as a result of their actions in Crimea and eastern Ukraine. Um, Russia is retaliating. Uh, what I think is most troubling or should disturb investors the most is not these sort of market manipulations because they've been going on for forever. Uh, it's hard. To, uh, you know, I don't think we have markets uh, in the world today. I think we have uh, uh, shadow plays and kabuki and uh, the pretense of markets. We don't have real markets. Um, you know, starting with the Fed, the Fed's manipulating U.S. dollar interest rates. Well, uh, since the U.S. is 60 percent of global reserves, U.S. dollar is 60 percent of global reserves, uh, and the interest rate is sort of the price of dollars. Well, when you manipulate interest rates, you manipulate everything in the world, every major market. It is priced off of dollars, references dollars, uh, so you're really manipulating everything. Uh, but, you know, we've seen LIBOR manipulation, uh, gold manipulation, foreign exchange manipulation, uh, energy manipulation. Show me a market that's not manipulated either by governments or bad actors or frauds or crooks, and, uh, you know, I, I can't think of one. So that sort of comes with the territory. But I think what you're uh, getting at, Jason, is something even more dangerous than normal government manipulation, which is financial warfare actually going into markets not for financial advantage, but for geopolitical advantage, and not to uh, sort of maximize your own wealth, but to destroy the wealth of others, uh, weaken them in geopolitical space. That's what is going on behind the scenes. Um, that's what's behind a lot of these cyber attacks. And I think one of the things that concerns me the most, you go back to the Cold War, uh, when we had what was called mutual assured destruction. That was a, a doctrine that said, you know, the United States had enough missiles to wipe out Russia, it was, you know, it was the Soviet Union at the time, but call it Russia. Um, the U.S. had enough missiles to wipe out Russia. Russia had enough missiles to wipe out the United States. Well, that's a very unstable system because the temptation is to shoot first, wipe out the other guy, and you win. Uh, so this led to an arms race. The two countries said, well, let's build more and more and more missiles. So if the other guy shoots first, we'll have enough missiles left over that survive. We can shoot back and wipe them out so that they won't shoot us in the first place. It's sort of a game theoretic uh, construct, and we call the two scorpions in the bottle. Uh, <clears throat> pardon me, you know, one, uh, one scorpion can sting the other, and the victim will die, but the victim has just enough strength left to sting back, and they both die. Uh, and so that was, that was what was called mutual assured destruction. Well, now we have mutual assured financial destruction where – as the U.S. throws its weight around, uses the dollar to intimidate geopolitical rivals and trading partners, the capacity of those other countries to strike back is much greater than it was in the past because of what's called asymmetric or, or, or unconventional warfare in cyberspace in particular. And the Russians are probably the best in the world at this. The U.S. is pretty good, but uh, Russia is extremely good also. Now, what should trouble investors is the risk of an accident. You, know, you go back to the Cold War uh, uh, nuclear warfighting scenarios I just described, the two most famous uh, movies of that era uh, from the 1960s, um, Fail Safe and Dr. Strangelove, both great movies, by the way, uh, shot in black and white, um, involved nuclear warfare between Russia and the United States, but they both involved either accidents or rogue officers in the chain of command. It was not sort of an intentional premeditated strike. It was something that went wrong in the system. And when you're fighting cyber warfare in complex systems, the potential for some uh, you know, mid-level person to be loading some code or updating some attack code or installing an attack virus in the operating system of, say, the NASDAQ stock exchange, something that, was, but that did happen, by the way, it was real, revealed publicly 
uh, last summer by uh, Bloomberg Businessweek that there was a Russian attack virus discovered by the FBI and Department of Homeland Security inside the NASDAQ operating system. Um, so that should come as no, no surprise. But in the course of doing that, you know, does somebody push the wrong button or write, load the wrong code or do something that accidentally shuts down the markets? And that's entirely possible. And that's a reason for investors to have some of their wealth in non-digital form. So non-digital wealth would be uh, physical gold, physical silver, fine art, land, things that cannot be wiped out by uh, um, a digital warfare, things that cannot be frozen or locked in place by the U.S. government. So you do want some of your wealth, not all of it by any means, but some of it in uh, in tangible form. So it's uh, been great uh, talking to you, Jason. really enjoyed the interview and uh, uh, look forward to doing it again soon. Yes, I definitely look forward to doing it again soon, Jim, and hopefully we can continue to talk about currency wars, financial warfare, and uh, get to ask you some more detailed questions on the gold market on the next interview. Thank you, Jason.